Oh, Tom, do you have an announcement about a new newsletter? I think you should let them know about it. Well, do you? I'm only. Do I, you have the brief? I can, do it, I can do it. I can do it. Okay. Global optimism's brilliant staff. Are hey, creating. wait a minute. Are you sure that this isn't an announcement that should be sung? Okay. No, I can. I can. I can try and like scat. It'll be more improvised. It may go hip hop. It's very hard to know what will happen. I'm excited. Global optimism. <laughs> Wonderful staff are curating, curating, curating a weekly newsletter. What signals amidst the noise? Demonstrating the momentum we all need. I can't do this anymore. It's horrible. It's like a cat being kind of strangled in an alleyway. It's good. Okay. It's not going to be sung. I'm sorry. If I had the music, I had a bit more time, mm. I could have done it. Um, mm-hmm. But I think if I'd gone on, we would have got complaints. We've, we've had a lot of very positive comments. We've got to, we've got to fight <laughs> off, avoid those complaints. Okay. Take two. Global Optimism's amazing staff are curating a weekly newsletter. Signals amidst the noise, demonstrating the momentum we all need to keep our eye on in moving. What? <laughs> demonstrating the momentum we all need to keep our eye on in moving towards a net zero world. Knowing more and scrutinizing public commitments is an important step in the global crisis. Please check us out on Twitter at Global Optimism and subscribe. <laughs> that was better. That was better. Okay, link is in the show notes. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rafit Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This day is Earth Day 2021. It's a big day, big summit in the US. We're going to be speaking about the Biden summit. We're also going to discuss the ratification of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, the fact that carbon emissions have soared this year, the UK has set a bold climate target for 2035, and we're going to speak to special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry about his recent deployment overseas and we have music from Aaron Fraser. Thanks for being here. Right, Earth Day is a big day. I never grew up with Earth Day being a big day but since I have grown up I've realised that our friends in the United States think of it as a very significant day and really I enjoy it. I think it's fantastic. Paul? (laughs) You're laughing at me. <laughs> you got out of a job in the in the Earth Day promotion uh, function of Earth <laughs> no, Day. No, no, I brought it back. I think okay. it's very nice. Right, I like good, it. Very good. Happy Earth Day, Christiana and Tom. Christiana, every every day is Earth Day in Costa Rica, of course, isn't it? Indeed, indeed, indeed. But this is the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Um, and it is being used as a major political driving force moment for so many announcements. So the U.S. administration has called for what they thought was going to be one summit of 40 uh, heads of state and has now turned into several days of summit at heads of state level, at ministerial level, of uh, private stakeholder announcements, on and on and on. They are really going to town this week to um, drum up more and more action on climate change. God bless them. And it's a bold move, right? I mean, to put that stake in the to stake in the ground, two days of presidential time inside the first 100 days of the new administration. John Kerry, of course, crisscrossing the world up to now to pull together the deals that we will see unfold in, throughout the course of today and tomorrow. And we'll get to that in a minute. And of course, we'll speak to John Kerry. But first, Christiana, you wanted to speak about the Kigali Amendment. Why is that important? Well, we don't usually speak about other protocols and other conventions. We're not here. protocolists, um, though, are we? Well, yeah, but they're we all have lovely. to. Uh, they're, they're just lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Every, I, we know, have we to open the tent a little bit. Exactly. Open the tent. So, some listeners may remember that there is such a thing called the Montreal Protocol, which actually brings countries together uh, to reduce the ozone depleting substances that they produce. And uh, the Kigali Amendment to, and and it is actually widely held as the most successful environmental 
legal uh, agreement ever because it has been very successfully implemented due to the fact that it was completely funded. Now, very different. To- proof that we can do it, though. Very important. Proof that we can fix well, things. Proof that we can do it, but uh, but it definitely the the scope of it obviously is much smaller than uh, than true, diminishing true. greenhouse gases. Still, the, a very there was important. Actually, I- I don't want to distract you. But however, there was recently an economist report that said it was the second most effective. Can you guess what the first was? No. The China one child policy. Anyway, back to your point. Ah, as an environmental. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, but that mm. was not a multilateral agreement, Good point. I don't yeah. think. <laughs> okay. Christian, you're always right, but just give Tom his like four seconds or something there. You I thought I had, I thought I had it's it. gone now, but just, you know. <laughs> Please. <laughs> four <laughs> seconds, four seconds. Montreal Protocol. So uh, several years ago, uh, the Kigali Amendment was adopted, which actually brings a new substance into the Montreal Protocol, the HFCs, because of mostly they are also ozone depleting, but they have a huge, huge climate effect. And so those were included. And now the question is, how successful are we going to be in uh, being able to phase out those. And the reason why that's important is because if we are able to fully implement the Kigali Amendment, um, we would actually phase down the production of those HFCs by at least 80% over the next few decades, which shaves off 0.5 degrees centigrade of global temperature wow. rise. And so when we're saying, you know, we really, really, really want to keep this to 1.5, 0.5 turns out to be a huge deal. Uh-huh. So it is a huge deal. And this week, or rather last week, um, because it occurred on Friday, we had something that was, from a geopolitical point of view, very interesting, but also just from a physical point of view, very interesting. From a geopolitical point of view, China and the U.S. had not ratified the, the um, Kigali Amendment. And on Friday, not in the context of a conversation with the U.S., not in the context of the climate summit that um, President Biden has called, but rather in the context of the virtual summit between France, Germany, and China, so in a European context, China announced that it would ratify the Kigali Amendment. Very interesting that they chose to do it in a European context and not in the U.S. context, which they perfectly well could have. But then they were followed very, very quickly with the United States saying, we're also going to ratify. So very interesting that up until then, we had 118 countries um, and the European Union that had ratified, but the absence of China and U.S. are huge or were huge. Now they're going to um, ratify because they account respectively 29% of all of these greenhouse gases, China and 26, um, the US. And so, so ratifying and implementing is a huge contribution. So that from a geopolitical, you know, let's think about why China chose to do that in the European context and not hmm. in the US context. So we can have many different theories around that. But from a physical point of view, how important it is that independently of the geopolitical message that they're sending, that both China and the United States, clearly having checked that out with each other, are now going to enter into this amendment and um, and bring about an accelerated phase down. Because China, on her own, uh, would be able to phase out more than half of the world's HFC production and consumption. So a huge wow. win for climate, huge win for, for climate, um, that comes at the same time as uh, as this Biden summit, but is actually just sort of put into the broader package. And and why why is it taken so long? Because Kigali, the Kigali Amendment was negotiated ages ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it's taken long because um, I don't think it's easy for either the U.S. or uh, or China to do this. It does require a very, very clear um, regulation of the industry for them to move off of HFCs and on to the alternatives. And, um, and, and it does require actually funding to be able to do so. So I am assuming, but, you know... 
we will have to wait and see. I haven't looked into that, that the U.S. is going to actually help the Pass companies the to do this and China will help their companies. So it does require a public-private uh, collaboration there to be able to phase down those HFCs in a timely fashion. Wow. Absolutely beautiful, though, to see this race to the top and not the race to the mm. bottom that we're so yes. familiar about. And I don't want to speculate about why China would, would uh, announce this in a European context. It might be a little bit to do with the fact that, uh, uh, y- y- you know, uh, China is, is, is noticing that the return of the United States to kind of uh, the climate um, debate because of the, the sort of the dark days of the Trump administration means that, that, that you know, leadership from the, from the United States is not guaranteed. Um, but great to see that the... Uh, big-hearted Biden administration immediately follows uh, China and uh, the big countries are being grown up alongside the 180 smaller ones who got there first. It didn't, yeah. didn't China describe the return of the US as the return of a truant child coming back to school rather than a returning king as China as the US comes back <laughs> to climate to climate. It's written in a slightly childish yeah, way, but the, I kind of get the point. <laughs> yeah, I get I get the point. And I think that yeah. is why they chose to do it right that in way. the European context. Now, certainly it, it was just two days after uh after a special Envoy John Kerry had been in China, so um, obviously they talked about this. Um, But China doesn't want to be seen as being pulled into climate because of the U.S. China wants to have its position and its contribution fully respected on its own. Uh, And so I think that's why they chose to do it on the European context. And then the U.S., of course, came in right behind and uh, supported. But, But very interesting geopolitical moves here. Yeah. Can I turn that question around, Christiana? Um, do you think the US um, were, are worried about being pulled into this by China? Well, honestly, the US should be committed to being pulled in because of the planetary emergency, uh, way above China. Well, as they are, of course, uh, now. Yeah, I mean, you know, after four dark years uh, of the US, the, the US can't just smoothly dovetail into the effort. <laughs> They have got to take uh, a leadership position and uh, and be very, very um, determined about what they're going to get done in the next four years for two reasons. Number one, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a second term to this administration or, in fact, even to that political party. But also, from a global perspective, the end of the, let's call it the first term, although we don't know, of the Biden administration or the Biden-Harris administration, is already going to be halfway through our decisive decade. Right. And so for both reasons, both for national political reasons, but as well as for global emergency reasons, they have got to not just run, but gallop. Okay, we're going to have to move on. Um, although I, that was a really, really interesting, I learned a lot there. And I also particularly like that you describing the re-entry of the US into climate dipl- diplomacy was accompanied by your impression of British aristocracy, which I always enjoy when that <laughs> I gets was, brought into the podcast. That. Oh, yeah, exactly. Smoothly right. dovetail smoothly. in a sort of heavily sarcastic <laughs> voice. is a, a treasure, Christiana. Thank you. Now, Paul, do you mind if I jump in? I've got something I'm so excited Go to share. It. All right, okay, so... Um, so on Friday, a few days ago, um, I was forced to go on the Today programme on the BBC by Sharon, our comms director, who occasionally forces me to do terrifying things like that. Um, but it was great. And uh, for those who aren't based in the UK, the Today programme is the most listened to breakfast show. And I was coming on to talk about the credibility of the British government in hosting the COP and did they have the means necessary. And I said during the interview, because I was Ooh. challenged, yeah, I was challenged of like, you know, nice. opening coal mines, all this sort of thing. And I said, you know, all of that's important, but the real test is going to be, is Boris Johnson going to adopt the recommendations of the Climate Change Committee, the sixth carbon budget, to be 78% reduction by 2035? Right now, we're committed to 68% by 2030. And that's really important because those five years from 2030 to 2035 are where the rubber really meets the road in decarbonisation. All the energy stuff is done. It's the hard to abate sectors. Little did I know. So do you think, wait, do you think Boris Johnson was listening to you over his breakfast? Well, I mean, you actually have to. The Queen makes the Prime Minister listen to the Today programme. It's kind of uh, traditional. I, I'm, I'm now approaching Paul Dickinson levels of, you know, assumptions of power. <laughs> no, I don't think it had anything to do with me, but it was, it was, um, it was amazing to see that today, uh, we're recording this on Tuesday the 20th, that's exactly what the UK did. Committed to 78% reduction by 2035. Now, 
This isn't a time period that will be relevant for Glasgow. Everyone's talking about 2030 for Glasgow. But putting out that additional marker of 2035 on the way to net zero by 2050, of course, it now needs to be backed up with regulatory measures and incentives and other things. It's a pretty big deal. No other country has done that yet. So, um, you know, I mean, I don't like to point out that Costa Rica doesn't have that kind of target, but it just doesn't have it. So, you know. Oh, my God, I'm going to hide. I'm going to hide. Um, this is correct, but it's actually only countries that have high emissions who can provide high emission reduction. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Yeah, no, it's very hard to to reduce your emissions from a sort of intolerable. You can't, you know, <laughs> worry about opening coal mines when you've never had it. When any, you've yeah. never had a coal mine. Yeah, exactly. It's like, what's Costa Rican's army reduction strategy? Well, never needed one. I mean, we don't big, like a... to we don't like to reduce our army because we have an army of ants, turtles, <laughs> birds. So we don't reduce our army. Okay. So what do you guys think of this target? And then we'll go to Paul's thing. It, it's big. It's big stuff. I mean, you know, they're, they're talking about that. You know, what's it going to mean? It's going to mean electricity system that operates without carbon emissions, reduction in meat and dairy consumption across the UK, introducing low carbon heating systems in homes, planting woodland. Uh, you know, it's 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 big stuff. But I mean. I was trying, trying to work out, like, you know, how do you achieve these goals? And you've heard me talk about it before, but I've got a stat this time. Cigarettes, my friends, cigarettes. Did you know a packet of cigarettes in Nigeria will cost you 91 cents, not even $1? In the UK, it'll cost you $14. In Australia, a packet of cigarettes, the same packet, will cost you $25. If you want to get things out of your society, you make them more expensive. It's so simple. That's my observation. Nice observation. Christiana, anything to add? No, I think all has been said on that topic. <laughs> so so I, I will I will add something then moving to the US and yes. actually talking about how exciting it is that John Morton has been appointed reporting directly to the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. Um, and he is going to be responsible for building a kind of climate hub inside the US Treasury, uh, which is going to focus on trying to link up domestic finance, international affairs, tax policy, reporting, as I said, directly to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. There is so much scope here for us to build regulation-driven markets. Brilliant policy is going to get the US moving. I hope and believe, I mean, some people have been a bit sniffy about whether he's the right person or whatever, some people in NGOs. But look, what I think is most hopeful here is that we just get that power of finance, that power of technology, that power of regulation, combining, aligning and delivering the solutions we need. And, you know, it could all be done super fast to the general advantage of the United States economy. They've done it before. A nod from Christiana. Silence from Tom. No, no, an additional... You know, where's the applause? Can we do this in front of an audience? <laughs> I mean, we Would... could... I could add a studio track. If you could, Clay, if you could okay, just put yeah, in something yeah, like yeah, really yeah, over yeah. the top. Yeah. Okay. Something so something people just think, crazy. what was yeah. that? You know, yeah. Just something shockingly large. Okay. I'm going to add something in, so just do it again. Oh, that was quite a long thing to say. Um, you got it. Don't I'll, worry about I'll, it. I'll just say it to the better of you. Okay, okay. you're on in three, um, two. Um, and I think this represents... Ladies and gentlemen, an entirely new era for the world. And then the applause. Birthday. Race to zero. Uh, so there you go. Good, good. What were we talking about? John Morton? <laughs> Tom? No, I think it's great. I think it's very exciting. They're making some fantastic appointments all across the Biden administration. I know John Morton a bit. I've know, been in various meetings with him. He's very impressive. He really knows how to pull stakeholders together. He understands, of course, the economics and what's required. So I think we can expect great things. Okay, so one last thing, the scary thing. Who's going to talk about it? I think it's one thing the each, IEA isn't it? The IEA report. Exactly. The Go IEA, it, well, they were talking um, this week about emissions rising very significantly, the second biggest rise since the rise after the 2008 um, economic crisis. And, you know, uh, Fatih Birol talking about 
you know, this is like the head of the International Ag uh, Energy Agency. This is shocking and very disturbing, he says. On the one hand, governments today are saying climate change is their priority. But on the other hand, we are seeing the second biggest emissions rise in history. It is really disappointing. So that is just a little something to kind of cool our heels a little bit, a little reality check. And is that, I mean... I, I appreciate that obviously that is disastrous and, 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 and a cause for great outrage, but is it only due to the massive drop last year that it looks that we're calling it such a massive increase? Are we back onto the trajectory or where we of where we would have been? Or is it because there was a 7% drop last year that looks like a massive spike this year? Well, what, no, no, we've got to kind of reduce it like 7% a year pretty much. You're right, you know? of course, we need to reduce it and that re oh, reduction sweet needs to go right. further. But does it mask the fact? Calling it the biggest rise in history, is that slightly misleading because it really was the biggest drop in history and then a return to business as usual? Look, I, you know, there are, there's no absolute sort of truth outside of the human soul, but I trust the <laughs> IEA when they give that kind of uh, grim warning. We have the, the pleasure and honour of speaking to uh, John Kerry shortly, and uh, he has been giving very stark comments on global media about um, the inaction on emissions. So I'm inclined to say that, uh, yes, it may be somewhat worsened by uh, the return of, uh, of, of of sort of our economies with these these stimulus packages. But I mean, come on, you know, have, haven't we learnt, you know, what it means to to have a global problem? Haven't we got lessons from the pandemic? Haven't we redesigned our societies? It looks like we haven't, not yet. All right. So let's turn to the interview now with Secretary Kerry. But um, wait. Oh, uh, yes. But wait. I would love to, if I may, just very quickly read out a comment from a listener, Mustang Erin, who has about the coolest name I've ever heard of from the United States. Uh, she put a review on, or he put a review. <laughs> they put a review on Apple Podcasts that says, I love everything about this podcast. This is the best climate change podcast out there, in my opinion. The banter is great, and I learn so much from every episode. I found you guys through the you girls, you guys through the Climate Question BBC podcast, which is also great. Christiana, you are my hero. Aww. Your intelligence, thoughtfulness, and ability to cut straight to the issue with no with a no nonsense attitude is inspirational. This podcast has motivated me to become much more aware of my behaviors and change them for the better. Thanks. Wow. That's fantastic. Wow. What an endorsement. How generous. How totally generous. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. Right. So now let's turn to an astonishing interview. We are so fortunate and so privileged mm. and honoured this week that we had the opportunity today, just a few hours ago on Tuesday the 20th, to speak to Secretary John Kerry. Now, John Kerry currently holds the title of U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, uh, appointed, of course, by President Joe Biden. Formerly, he was Senator and Secretary of State under President Barack Obama. Um, he is a tireless and dedicated campaigner for climate action. He played an essential role in the construction of the Paris Agreement. We were very honoured to speak to him today, recently back from his trip to China, just before the Biden Summit on Climate Change, which is launching today. Hope you enjoy this conversation and we will be back afterwards. Secretary John Kerry, how delightful that you're joining us on Outrage and Optimism. Welcome back to the United States from your Asia trip. Um, a pretty important, a pretty important trip. And I've been thinking as you have been uh, talking to your colleagues in Korea, Japan, China, I've been thinking it is really very fortuitous that the four years of the Biden administration take us halfway into what we now know is the decisive decade on climate change. By 2025, when at least the first term of that administration would finish, the course on emission reductions will be set for 2030. And we know we have to be at one half emissions by 2030. And furthermore, COP26 sets the path over these first five years from now until 2025. So all of those mileposts need to be seamlessly integrated in order to protect 1.5 degrees as our top permissible temperature increase. So here is, in that context, here's my question to you, because it seems, as I think about uh, the U.S. returning to climate responsibility, 
that there is at least a double challenge. First, the challenge is how to engender and secure trust in long-term U.S. domestic consistency. We all know there's a political price of democracy. We all know that we won't have decent legislation in the United States. We will have to build on regulation. But we've also seen how quickly regulation can be turned. So how do you engender trust in long-term U.S. domestic uh, regulation and consistency? And the second, or which comes off of your recent trip, I saw you in the build-up to Paris do brilliant bilateral diplomacy and then fold it in so beautifully into the multilateral process, which is basically the same thing that has to happen now, only on a much, much more constrained timescale. So how, how are you viewing that? And, um, and the first question, trust in long-term U.S. domestic consistency. Well, Christiana, first of all, it's wonderful to be with you, and thank you for your tremendous leadership uh, through the years here. Uh, we're going to need everybody on board to get this job done. It's as gigantic as any challenge I've ever seen for countries, not just governments, but for everybody. Uh, how are we going to regain trust? We're not going to do it by talking. Uh, we're not going to talk our way into a trustworthy position. We have to take action. And that's why uh, President Biden began immediately by joining Paris, secondly issued an executive order that makes climate uh, a critical component of all government decision making. Every department, every cabinet officer has to now factor climate into every decision that we're making. Third, he set the date for the summit. Uh, this week, Earth Day, Thursday, uh, we are convening 40 heads of state And because it's virtual and around the world with 12 time zones, we, we obviously can't have everybody at the same meeting. So I'll be meeting with over 60 countries on uh, Wednesday morning, tomorrow morning, and then Friday morning as part of the summit uh, where people were not able to be there in head of state status. But these are ministerial conversations we will have and they'll fold in. The consequences of those conversations, we will fold into the summit. But at the summit, We not only have convened the 20 leading economies of the world, which as you know, we worked with leading up to Paris. We're reconvening that, but we're also based on the Paris lesson about some of the countries that felt not listened to enough as we came into the final week, which is part of the reason for the 1.5, as you remember. We are inviting uh, vulnerable countries to take part in this summit with the leading economies. So Bangladesh will be there, uh, the Marshall Islands will be there and so forth, small nations from different continents. So every one of the leaders are listening to those who are most negatively impacted by the climate crisis. And environmental justice is a key component of what uh, the Biden administration is, is going to be addressing. And, and, and I hope that will help create uh, an easing into Glasgow We look at every event, not as a thing separate from Glasgow. The whole purpose of this is to build towards Glasgow, to build ambition in all nations around the planet. So that's, the, that's really the centerpiece of this, of this summit, raising ambition now because 2020 to 2030 are the critical years. That is the decision decade. And, and we can't have people content to just put 2050 net zero out there, but that's 30 years away. And we all know what will happen. A whole bunch of nations will do too little now. Just today, headlines in The Guardian uh, saying uh, carbon emissions to soar in 2021 by the second highest rate in history. That's unacceptable. Yep. It should yeah. everybody the IEA act. report. Yep. Yes, that's the, the new IEA report. report. So we are going to, the president will clearly lay out what the United States will do. But we've been working with more than 20 countries specifically to ask them to raise ambition at this summit. So you'll have to see what people do there. And um, I, I think that we are going to try to keep the Earth's temperature as we should to the maximum rise of 1.5 degrees. Now, when I, just went, when I just went to India recently in the last few weeks ago, 
Prime Minister Modi has set a target of 450 gigawatts of renewables deployed by 2030. But India will need a partnership to try to help make that happen. So we agreed to step up with finance and with technology in order to work together with the UAE and with other countries, with Sweden, with UK and others. We want to come together to help India be able to do that. Why? Because if India can deploy that 450, India is holding and keeping faith with the 1.5. Hmm. So what we want to do is make sure people know and see and have the message from these early days, this is doable. This is exciting. This is the greatest job creator in the history of, 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 of our planet since the Industrial Revolution. And if we all embrace the, those possibilities, that's where we think the United States can earn some credibility back. Now, we look at the G7 in June as a, as a focal point. We look at the UNGA uh, meeting in September as a focal point, the G20 in Italy right before Glasgow, and then boom, we're into Glasgow. And leaders will fly from Italy to Glasgow, and hopefully we've done our homework enough with the experiences we learned in Paris that we are uh, bringing everybody together, recognizing what people can do and, and all of us being bolder because otherwise we don't get there. So we've got to uh, press nations to really get ambitious. And I think the critical years are 2020 to 2030 in which we do that. Right. And the United States needs to earn its spurs, yeah. not by talking, by doing. So, so th I, thank you so much. for that. There's so much in that and the road to 2030 and the critical nature of it. Really, that's the game now, right, rather than 2050. I just want to ask you a couple of questions about how far we can get onto that 1.5 degree trajectory throughout this year, what your hope is for that. And as a result of that, kind of what the press release says the day out of Glasgow. I mean, just looking at the numbers, there's some analysis going around the UK government at the moment that suggests that to get us onto a two degree trajectory, we need to find a further 12 gigatons of reductions by 2030. And to get us onto a 1.5 degree trajectory, we need to find 29 gigatons. So an ambitious Chinese commitment might be five, the US NDC maybe two, EU target got us a gigaton. You know, you sort of add those together and you think there's a big gap. So how do we fill that gap? Is it national commitments? Is it sectoral deals? And as a result of that work, where are we on the day after Glasgow? How much of that gap have we filled? Well, let me let me be absolutely candid on this, uh, because we need candor and we need to be operating around facts, not operating the way the Trump administration did, making things up and ignoring the science. We know that even if we got to net zero by 2050, we're not finished. We know we have to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. So we have a technology chase here, and that is part of what we need to discuss in the context of 2020 to 2030. We're gonna be upping our efforts for R&D, for innovation. Bill Gates will be talking at our summit and he will be laying out and a whole panel will be discussing the innovation and where we are and where we need to get to. I have argued with people that we need, I mean, you know, COP26 needs to be the, the honest COP. Hmm. We need to go there and know what we can do and we're determined to do. So every country in that particularly, 20 nations account for 81% of all emissions. Those 20 nations need particularly to come to Glasgow and make it clear that they're going to get on the 1.5 track and they're going to be moving faster to get out of coal, to, to shift even from uh, gas uh, to some degree. I mean, gas is being talked about as the great bridge. Well. OK, if you're rapidly deploying out of out of coal and you have an end time for the use of the gas, we don't want to build out a whole new, huge, right. monumental gas infrastructure. And then the fight becomes in 20 years over stranded assets and whether or not we're going to you know, lose some of the jobs that are now invested in that. You can hear the political fight over that. Yeah. Let's avoid it. The reality is that Countries are doing very well at 85, 90 percent, a few of them, the ones that have really taken the plunge in being uh, renewable. And if we can, if we push the battery storage curve 
which now is beginning to happen. We're getting utility battery storage at four hours or more. If we can begin to up that, whoever breaks through with storage worth weeks, it's a game changer. Yeah. And they'll be richer than Jeff Bezos. Yep. So, yep. you know, I think what we can do, folks, is keep pushing. And here's where I said the honest cop. There will be a gap. We have to acknowledge the gap. We have to define the gap. And we have to go after the gap. And I believe that we, we particularly, the, a lot of the countries that are technology uh, very proficient, and there are many of them in the world, I mean, Israel is particularly technology proficient. Uh, you know, Russia, uh, China, uh, Europe, obviously. India. United States, India, India particularly. I mean, Japan. I mean, there are a lot of countries. And if we pull people together and say, okay, is it going to be direct air carbon capture? Is it going to be yeah, CCUS? Yeah. And we can do better in terms of these things. If we're honestly working at it and investing now in what we can do, we can get there. And if we fake it, we're, we're, we're in trouble. And thank you for that, that actually inspiring point to remind us absolutely that we can do this. So then it comes a little bit to the, uh, the, the, the will of the people, in a sense, supporting their governments. Uh, that's, that's what can be achieved. Um, I, I loved a response you gave in India to a journalist when you said, we've got to behave like the adults we are, allegedly, you said. <laughs> and um, here's the thing, you know, it's, it's like a, it's a serious situation. It's like wartime, you know, and, and, you know, national leaders in every country need to, need to you know, we've been talking about national security, which is great. Um, can I ask you how we might think of getting more government communications to the people? Because I guess people can only really act as adults if they're informed adults. And I think a lot of people around the world still don't realize, you know, how serious it is. You do a wonderful job of, 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 of speaking about it in the media. But, but can we step that up a level? And if so, how? Well, we all have to work at, uh, in our societies relative to the different tensions we have. We have a particular challenge in the United States, which I acknowledge up front. And that is, we don't have the same referees we used to have with respect to the truth. And if you can't determine what the truth is and a baseline from which you are starting to make the choices you have to make, we've got a problem in, in democracies. So we have to fight for that. We are fighting for that. President Biden has already changed that equation. And, and it, I, I, I was today at a place earlier this morning and somebody commented to me, it's so much calmer now in America. <laughs> And, I, you know, now let's see what happens. And, you know, we still have racial tension. We still have some of these big challenges, but we're not waking up to daily lying tweets. You know, it, it's a difference. And that's the beginning of the fight. And we've all it's got such to a relief. Away. It's such a relief. Such a relief. Senator <laughs> Kerry, it wasn't just the U.S. where the whole world was waking up to those tweets or going to but, bed but to them. That's what, that's what people are saying now. Honestly, I hear people say, what a relief. But, it, but boy... We don't have the time just to be relieved. We got to go to work, yeah. folks. And and the wartime analogy is absolutely real. I've used it. That's why I started yeah. World War Zero. World War Zero, because it's it's global. You can't do this without all the nations involved, particularly the twenty critical economies. It is it is war because some people have declared war on facts. They've declared war on science. There's a denialism at large that is very, very dangerous. And we have to really fight to bring back from that. And zero, because the goal is we have to get to zero emissions. We just have yeah. to. So um, I think that, uh, I mean, to me, this is not mere chatter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's the reality of what we, what we see as opportunity in this. This is not doomsday. I, I really think... One of the things that I tried to do with China the other day was change the equation of people feeling, oh, my God, you know, we can't even get everybody together on the same page. How are we going to possibly do this? Well, China, for the first time ever, we, the headline of our, of our joint statement, U.S.-China joint statement on climate crisis. Mm -hmm. They have never called it a crisis. And not only it was repeated in the body of the text where they said it's urgent, it's serious. And for the first time, instead of being content to say our plat, we're going to we're going to peak at 2030, 
And then if you looked at their plans, the peak went out from there as a plateau, not a reduction. They're now saying we must take actions in the 2020s. Mm. And if President Xi comes to the summit on Thursday, which we hope he will, uh, we anticipate he may well lay down some of the steps China is going to take in the 2020s to move faster. So if China and the United States, it's sort of a, you know, similar to what we did in 2013 when I went to China and negotiated yep. President Xi, and then we came to Paris jointly, not because we want to be joint, but because we want to, I mean, we want to be cooperating, but we want people to see that this issue is bigger yeah. than two nations. This issue are the differences between us, which are the real. We've got to all compartmentalize climate as the thing that absolutely we need to move on and, and do. Now, one thing I'd share with you, which is different, um, and climate and China, by the way, repeated throughout the statement, the willing, the need to mitigate, to adapt, to be resilience, to come together and share that endeavor. But I have been working with. Uh, the largest financial institutions in the United States over the course of the last um, several months. And you've all heard the names, you know, the big names of, you know, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, et cetera. They are setting out in the next few days, and there's many, and a number of them have released. I mean, one of them, you know, individually, they've already said, we're going to do a trillion dollars over the next 10 years because we've been working with them to concentrate how much can you put into climate investment and how, mm -hmm. because no government has the trillions necessary in the climate gap, in the crisis, in the finance gap to do what we need to do to get this job done. Mm -hmm. So they Correct. have now stepped up and we have several trillions of dollars that they will invest in alternative energy, renewable, in uh, solar in wind and, next generation of storage of uh, hydrogen, geothermal, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If, if, and, and these are commercial capacities. So this is what we want to do with India. We, the United States, want to work with these other countries, put the finance on the table, get the power purchase agreements that we need, and begin to move and accelerate the deployment as if we're really in a war. And we have allies, and we're coming together with a real plan mm. to get job done. That's what we need to do. Well, you know, that is what we need to do. And I've been delighted to see that the financial sector has moved so dramatically over the past two years, except the financial sector in the U.S. And so it is really thrilling to hear that the financial sector in the U.S. is now waking up to the threat to their to their values yeah. and to their assets totally. and realizing that this is about protecting their assets and investing into profitable investments, as you've been saying it for years. So, um, John, what is after this? All eyes this week are clearly on uh, this uh, series of summits that you and President Biden have uh, convened. After this week, which is going to be uh, hopefully tectonic, um, after this week, what is the next step for you on the road to Glasgow? Well, the next step becomes continued diplomacy. Uh, we, we will work uh, with countries. We have teams that have, we've put together. Uh, we've sat with many of these countries and said, look, I mean, not, you know, this is not, we're not trying to do the heavy hand or the big foot or whatever. We're trying to work with people, hmm. trying to cooperate, but we're trying to bring some technical expertise to the table that can show some countries how you actually could make your distribution of energy more efficient or ways in which you could rapidly transition out of coal rapidly and and do the following so um our hope is that that diplomacy i mean we're sharing this effort with everybody mm -hmm. and, and and others will engage i hope in that diplomacy with us we want to work in a cooperative way with every country that wants to work at this because no one country makes this happen no no one region makes this happen this is truly one of the most global multilateral initiatives we've ever engaged in and we all have to come together and christiana you know that you've done it you've been part of it you've been a leader in paris uh and and um we just need more countries to embrace the upside possibilities of the future we start getting this this air cleaner i mean this is pollution we're talking about pollution 
We used to have a polluter pays principle. It's a tough call, Mr. Secretary, and I, I do hope that, that it, your, your summit, you will be able to get the countries, those, those countries representing 81% and, and companies and investors to kind of make the laws so the polluter plays, because I think that will help steer investment. Well, I think you're going to be impressed. And, and President Biden is, is probably going to be calling for disclosure. Europe has already called for disclosure. I think there will be a global move towards disclosure personally. That's a fine thing, Secretary Kerry. That's a fine thing. And that's really going to begin to drive uh, the way people invest and where they invest. I'm getting signals from my team here. They're about to put a big anchor on me and haul me away. Yes, yes. We have to let you go uh, to your very busy schedule. Um, One word or, or one sentence from you at the end. We always ask people we interview to place themselves on somewhere along the range between outrage and optimism, which is the name of our podcast, because I think we need to be outraged that we haven't done more and quicker, but optimistic about everything that is can be done. So where on that spectrum would you place John Kerry in 2021? I'm 100% on both. (laughs) 100% outrage, 100% optimistic. Love it. I like that. I like that. Love it. (laughs) Secretary John Kerry, thank you so, so much, not just thank for you. being with us here, but for returning to the leadership on this challenging mm-hmm. issue of our times. Thank you Great so much. Great to be with you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Take care, thank everybody. You. Thank you. So, how wonderful to get the chance to sit and chat with Secretary John Kerry. What did you guys leave that discussion with? Well, first, I'm just so incredibly grateful that he took the time to talk to us. Yeah. His calendar, especially this week, is the most valuable real estate, right? Yeah. He's just come back from a very, very taxing trip to Asia, China, Japan, Korea, basically in three days, I believe, or four. He is supporting President Biden with the summit um, that Biden is hosting this week. He has his own summit with 60 ministers. He is just a very, very busy person this week. So thank you so much to him for taking the time out of his crazy schedule to to be with us. The the other thing that I wanted to say is as we were talking to him, and I'm sure um, Paul and and Tom that you remember this is um, yes, as as Tom mentioned. Um, At the beginning of this episode, he would come into the negotiating room at two, three o'clock in the morning and want to know what is going on and how can he help? How can he instruct the U.S. team? And um, really very, um, very impressive, his commitment. But I was also so deeply touched when literally five years ago on Earth Day, in the signing ceremony of the Paris Agreement in New York, in the United Nations, how when it came for him to pick up the pen and um, sign the Paris Agreement on behalf of the United States, John Kerry had his granddaughter on his knee. Mm. And that photograph of him with his little granddaughter just went around the world. And it is such a beautiful, um, a, a beautiful statement of how he understands the moral imperative on this, the intergenerational injustice that we must right, at the same time as he totally understands the economic imperative, because he is one of the most compelling speakers about the economic benefits that come from addressing climate change. And he'll rattle off, you know, how much investment and how many more, how many more jobs it's going to create. He is very, very clear that both of those are actually mutually reinforcing imperatives. And he takes that strength of those two arguments to all of his diplomacy. And that is a particular approach to diplomacy. He's not telling others what to do. He is very, very committed to both growing the global economy in a clean way and do so so that there is intergenerational and in fact let's say social justice to this and it just gives him 
such a different approach with leaders. And he is frankly so disarming uh, when he approaches any of these leaders. He, he really, I, I'm just in such gratitude. I don't think there is another U.S. citizen who was as helpful um, in the Paris Agreement as John Kerry. And I th he's definitely proven to already be incredibly helpful to the U.S. administration, and he will be a leading figure in the success of COP26. So you're a bit on the fence there, uh, Christiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't like him at all. <laughs> yeah, no, the, uh, I, I've never quite heard such a, an endorsement of, of somebody. Um, I mean, I was really moved by, by his comments, um, him focusing on, you know, the, the kind of the forces of uh, opposition that we face. And he, he said it, it, it focuses on truth. He said truth itself, you know, it ha has become something that we fight over. And I, and I was really pleased to hear him talk with such kind of clarity about how that's the kind of foundation for us. He, he, he mentioned, he called it the honesty cop, which I think uh, is going to be the name of this uh, uh, episode, you know, and, and, and that's the heart of this, you know. We've got a we've got a massive problem. We've got a, we've got a, a chemical problem with the atmosphere. We've got a geophysical problem with the energy from the sun. We've got a, a political problem between all these nations, and we've got a kind of social science problem that underpins that. But I don't think he's afraid to to address that to talk about it. And actually, um, you know, I, I, I he also alluded to mandating corporate disclosure uh, and, and other kinds of financial disclosures related to climate change, which moved me very deeply, having spent twenty years trying to. Uh, to, to, to achieve disclosure from uh, uh, corporate entities uh, regarding their emissions and, of course, cities, uh, to hear him say, OK, we're going to definitely put that into the law. Uh, it made me uh, also want to join you, uh, Christiana, in, in the kind of John Kerry chorus choir of appreciation. <laughs> Well, I'm definitely in there too, and I would. I mean, there, there. I would say I like the honest cop as uh, as a name for this episode, but there is a contender which is 100 percent outraged, 100 percent optimistic, which I thought is the yes, best answer. I love that one too. That we'd ever yeah, had. No, best answer which actually, ever had. I think all of us have that, right? <laughs> yeah. I think I think it was such a beautiful statement of what where we all are on that. Yeah, it was like you know all of it. Let's do it. This is it, and just his dedication, his commitment, his determination, just shining through. And I mean, you know. Um, he's been at this a long time, but he's not tired. He's fired up and ready to go, as his old boss would say, um, and really committed to this issue. The other thing, just a very detailed thing that I thought was, was interesting, we didn't push him on gas, natural gas, but he jumped straight in there. Right, and he was straight yes. into saying we ha we cannot get locked in to an infrastructure around gas. He was a hundred percent clear that we need to move away from coal and straight to renewables. There's no realistic kind of building of infrastructure, and as a U.S. politician, that's kind of more brave than might immediately be apparent to some listeners, because he's actually sort of like calling for what is really needed and not sort of saying, well, we can sort of solve it in the near term with gas, because he knows that locks us into further problems down he the knows. road. He knows. He yeah. also didn't prevaricate on one. 1.5 degrees not at all he in was fact, very clear that that's the top that is the yeah. absolute ceiling he strengthened what came out of paris right it wasn't best efforts it was 1.5 maximum exactly <laughs> but he but he goes around the world you know uh, uh, talking to the media directly saying you know we've got to make these changes um or else we're going to have problems with food with water we're going to have problems with migration, people not able to live where they are. You know, he's inviting vulnerable countries, including Bangladesh, to the summit. I think that ability to kind of combine the need for industrial change with the, the you know, the, the moral duty we have to each other as citizens, I, I, I found that very inspiring and very effective. Yeah. So how wonderful to have a chance to talk to John Kerry and go through this episode. Uh, this has been very inspiring and exciting and just fascinating to see what comes out of the next 48 hours. We are at this critical inflection point on climate and it looks like it's going to be an amazing ride. So um, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating few days. Thanks for being here this week. As ever, we are going to leave you with some music this week. Aaron Fraser with the song Bad News. We'll hear from him and an introduction to the piece. Really hope you enjoy it. Thanks as ever for being here. This has been a great episode and we will see you next week. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. But I'm not somebody who personally believes that every single artist has to um, sort of engage with, with 
social issues directly, you know, in, in this model of like Marvin Gaye or, or Gil Scott Heron or Curtis Mayfield, you know, Bob Dylan, people like that. I do think that sometimes, you know, just having art that's purely escapist is, is also really important. But I think that artists that do engage with social issues uh, have a tremendous amount of good that they can do because they allow people to integrate thinking about these things into their everyday life. Because there's never like a great time to sit down and like think about climate change, right? So, and because it's big and scary, it's, it's also not an appealing thing to think about. So if you can integrate it into your everyday life, you can start to make decisions that can, that can make the world better, that can start to uh, change things that are systemically wrong. And I do think that starts with, with integrating it into your everyday life. My inspiration for the song Bad News was climate change. Um, I think that a lot of times when an issue feels really big um, and hard to solve, uh, like climate change or, or homelessness, for you know, for another example, um, I think it's easier to look away a lot of times. But I think when you feel that urge to look away, that's when it's probably most important to to stare directly into it. So um, the lyrics to the song, I wanted them to be read almost as if they're coming from mother earth so like you know i'm on fire i'm burning i can barely keep it turning um you know can be all of us just trying to uh get through it you know or it can be the planet sort of like asking for help and, and having it fall on deaf ears far too often
So there you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. My name's Clay. I'm the producer of this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The tune you just heard was Bad News by Aaron Frazier, and this track is just a sample of what you can enjoy from Aaron. I've been listening to his latest record titled Introducing. I highly recommend you check it out. It's got this mid-60s soul vibe, but it's really imaginative. It goes beyond that era, and, you know, when a Detroiter hears this record, it's just, it's Motown. It's Motown, and it just doesn't get better than that. It's like mom's cleaning the house on Sunday good. You know what I'm saying? It's great music, and it's great music for Earth Day. Aaron has partnered with the Sierra Club on an initiative called Soul Nation, which is a climate justice solutions-based organization led by black thought leaders who are closing the green gap and placing people at the core of environmental justice work. And that's what I'm talking about. So links in the show notes. Thank you, Aaron. And happy Earth Day, everyone. So what are you guys doing for Earth Day? I think myself. I'm going to check in on my compost pile, tune into a few virtual Earth Day events, and maybe plant some stuff. Oh, and I'm definitely going to check out the latest Signals Amidst the Noise newsletter from Global Optimism. It's actually true. I need to read up on that because I've been a bit busy this week and I didn't read it. But you can read along with me and subscribe. It's the perfect way to spend a nice Earth Day afternoon. And this newsletter is hot. I mean, we are getting a great response from all of you on it. Thank you for checking it out. Lots of subscribers. And I think Sharon actually told me it was, and I quote, going gangbusters, which is one of my new phrases. So link is in the show notes to that. Hit subscribe and read up. Outrage and Optimism is a Global Optimism production. Global Optimism is Sarah Law, Katie Bradford, Laura Richardson, Marina Mancilia German, Sophie McDonald, Freya Newman, Sarah Thomas, Sue Reed, and John Ward. Our executive producer is Sharon Johnson, and our producer is Clay Carnell. And our hosts are Christiana Figueres, Paul Dickinson, and Tom Rivet Karnak. Thank you so much to our guest this week, U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. It was great having you on. Okay, those are all my notes. That's a wrap. I'm going to go enjoy Earth Day. Happy 51st Earth Day. Send us a message on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Global Optimism with what you're up to today. And we'll see you next week. Bye.